And uh, we're very happy to present the Laura Shannon Lecture and Prize. And uh, as you know, I'm Donna Crafton, the interim director of the Nanovic Institute. And the prize is in contemporary European studies. And it's one of the Institute's signature identities. It's given to promote and recognize significant scholarship in both the humanities, history, and the social sciences. Not only does the prize serve to recognize scholarship, but it also, following the vision of Laura Shannon, brings those scholars to Notre Dame to interact with our faculty and our students. And incidentally, it carries a $10,000 prize. I had the opportunity to serve in the inaugural jury three years ago for the prize in the humanities. And I've seen how the, the prize builds um, uh, remarkable uh, uh, esprit de corps among the jurors and also uh, leads to heated conflicts and discussions about the nature of the award. The competition is very stiff. We're glad to um, do this though because it really is rapidly becoming a top tier prize. Uh, I think it'll be one of the, the most recognized literary prizes in a few years when word, word of mouth goes out and uh, it becomes viral sooner or later. We're welcome to, glad to welcome today's speaker to the ranks of the laureates. I'll return at the end of the lecture to present the actual prize. But at the moment, my role is to um, introduce our introducer. The Laura Shannon Prize has been fortunate to have some remarkable jurors in its short history. And that uh, is the group that evaluated the winner this year. The jury judging this award included Carol Emerson, a. Watson Armour III, University Professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures, Princeton University. Suzanne Marchand, Professor of History at Louisiana State University. Paul Woodruff, Professor of Philosophy and a noted translator at uh, uh, the School of Undergraduate Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. And from our own Notre Dame, Don Howard, Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Riley Center for Science, Technology, and Values. And um, Mark uh, Roach, the Ed Reverend Edmund P. Joyce, CSC Professor of German Language and Literature. Uh, let me also point out that the Notre Dame Bookstore has graciously set up a desk out there so you can examine and possibly buy uh, the previous Shannon Prize winners. Um, um, Tara Zara, uh, National Indifference in the Battle for Children in the Bohemian Lands, and Roberto Daimato, Europe in Theory, and of course, the Hebrew Republic. So allow me to introduce the former Dean of Notre Dame's College of Arts and Letters, current fellow at the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study, Professor Mark Roach. Uh, the audience gets nervous when someone is introducing the introducer. Uh, but uh, with the prize, I think it is appropriate to say a few words about the book. It is my pleasure to introduce Eric Nelson, Professor of Government at Harvard and recipient of the Shannon Prize. Eric received his AB summa cum laude from Harvard University and his PhD from the University of Cambridge. He's been awarded fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the American Council of Learned Societies. He's also been a British Marshall Scholar, a junior fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows, and a fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge. His research focuses on the history of political thought in early modern Europe and America, and on the implications of that history for debates in contemporary political theory. He's also published The Greek Tradition in Republican Thought and edited Hobbes' translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey for the Clarendon edition of the works of Thomas Hobbes. He is currently at work on a study of the political thought of the American Revolution, as well as a long-term project on property rights in the theory of justice. Let me say a few words about the Jewish Republic, which in addition 
to receiving the Shannon Prize was also named a choice outstanding academic title. The Jewish Republic is a short book, 139 pages, not counting notes. But it packs a lot of punch into those pages. Eric Nelson makes the fascinating and counterintuitive claim that three major modern ideas, the primacy of republican government, the redistribution of wealth, and religious tolerance stem not from emerging secularization, but from the 16th and 17th century reception of Jewish sources. I confess that I found the thesis so bold that I approached the summary introduction with considerable skepticism. How could this be? And if it were true, how could it have been overlooked for so long? Then I began to be persuaded by the detailed claims that were advanced along the way. And by the time Eric Nelson had marshaled his full and compelling case that even major thinkers adopted these modern ideas via a reception of Jewish sources, I could not sing the book's praises enough. In a pool of very good books, it stood out well above the pack. Let me return briefly to the three major claims. First, the Protestant reception of rabbinical biblical exegesis made clear that in advocating the idea of a king, one commits the sin of idolatry. Human kingship inherently usurps the kingdom of God. Thus, the Bible supports the idea of a republic. Second, the Roman agrarian laws, which involved redistribution of wealth, had long been viewed as partly responsible for the collapse of the Roman Republic. And so redistribution was seen in the 16th century as both dangerous and impolitic. But the early modern reception of biblical land law, seen through the prism of rabbinic commentaries, led to a complete reexamination of the issue. In the biblical worldview, God is the owner of all things. Private property is not absolute. It is God's. Not only is a prudential balance needed to protect peace, but such a balance is also just. To ensure a vision of civic life, republics ought to legislate limits on private ownership. Third, the more traditional and dominant narrative is that religious tolerance arose as religious orthodoxy began to recede. But God instructs the faithful to lodge the power to make laws in the hands of the civil sovereign. Civil law should address the external elements of religion so as to protect peace, but it cannot command the heart and so cannot legislate the internal matters of religion and religious creed. Therefore, the religious content of civil law should be narrow, opening up a realm that ensures tolerance. I've given you the conclusions, not the detailed evidence, which draws on history as well as philology. Still, I think you have some sense of the richness and counterintuitive claims uh, that the book entails and with which all future scholars must reckon. Indirectly, the book challenges from a historical as opposed to a sociological perspective the secularization thesis. Eric Nelson captures this beautifully with the line that we live even today in the age of Milton, not the age of Hobbes. The book's claims also have implicit overtones for our contemporary discussions of such questions as, what does it mean to idolize another human being? To what extent must the religious person embrace a concept of social justice, including the redistribution of wealth? What arguments, religious and secular, speak for tolerance? Like all good historical scholarship in the humanities, Nelson helps us learn not only about the past, but also from the past. Today, Eric Nelson will address the following topic. The Lord alone shall be king of America, European Hebraism and the Republican turn of 1776. Please join me in congratulating him on his prize and welcoming him to Notre Dame.
Uh, well, thank you, uh, first of all, for that uh, incredibly uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's a huge pleasure uh, for me, uh, as well as a great honor, uh, to be here with you uh, this evening uh, and to uh, accept the, uh, the Shannon Prize uh, for this year. Uh, I owe some thanks uh, before I get going, the first and most important of which uh, are to uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Shannon, uh, who I know couldn't be here this evening, uh, but whose uh, support of scholarship in the humanities and social sciences uh, at a moment in which such support is increasingly rare uh, is truly beyond praise, uh, and I'm uh, very grateful for it personally. Uh, I'm extremely grateful uh, to the Nanovic Institute uh, for hosting me, uh, and uh, most uh, spectacularly uh, to Monica Cairo, who has uh, been coordinating the details of this visit now for almost a year, I think, um, and uh, has uh, brought it off so far uh, without a hitch. Um, most importantly, she somehow managed to snag me football tickets. So uh, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to her, and of course to you for having the very good manners to go unbeaten this year. So to enhance my football weekend experience. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful uh, and, uh, uh, and, and honored to be here. So many thanks. Uh, I begin uh, tonight uh, with the words of William Drayton of South Carolina. Uh, writing in 1776, he declared that never were a people more wrapped up in a king than the Americans were in George III in the year 1763. This comment is justly famous, but it's also potentially misleading. George's personal popularity with his American subjects may indeed uh, have reached its zenith in the early 1760s, but as a political and constitutional matter, uh, leaders of the patriot cause were in fact far more wrapped up in their king in 1774 and 75, at the end of the imperial crisis, than they had been at the conclusion of the French and Indian War. Following the repeal of the Stamp Act, they had begun to theorize a radically reconfigured imperial constitution with a newly strengthened, prerogative-wielding sovereign uh, at its center. Their new political theory of empire had sought, in the words of Virginia's Thompson Mason, to reestablish the ancient independence of the crown and to restore the sovereign to that weight in the national councils which he ought to possess or as an anonymous critic put it rather less flatteringly, to pay compliment to the king's personal power at the expense of his authority. The patriot position thus embodied the sharpest possible break with the Whig tradition, as well as an outright assault on the ideological apparatus of the two parliamentarian revolutions of the English 17th century. Its proponents, as James Lovell of Massachusetts explained, regarded themselves as rebels against parliament who adore the king. Their endeavor was, quite simply, to convince George III that, quote, the claim of the British parliament over us is not only illegal in itself, but a downright usurpation of his prerogative as king of America. Royalism of this kind had not been seen or heard in Britain itself, for a hundred years. But that uh, is a story for another night. Uh, tonight, I want to talk instead about what happens next. For by the spring of 1776, a great rupture had occurred. Faced with what they regarded as George III's unaccountable silence in the face of increasingly punitive parliamentary legislation and his seeming indifference to their frantic and repeated petitions, as well as his own proclamation of August 75, declaring the colonies to be in a state of rebellion, British North Americans turned on their king with an unprecedented ferocity and began to pursue independence. The suddenness of this shift was widely remarked upon by contemporaries. David Ramsey, one of the revolution's first historians, observed in 1789 that, quote, the change of the public mind of America regarding connection with Great Britain is without parallel. He reminded his readers that it was not until sometime in 1776 that the colonists began to contend that it was for their interest to be forever separated from Great Britain. Drayton himself anticipated Ramsey's analysis, marveling in 76 at the, quote, unexpected, wonderful, and rapid movements that had marked the final six months of the crisis, and recalling that as late as the previous summer, 
Quote, even with the sword of the murderer at their breasts, the Americans thought only of new petitions to the king. It is well known there was not even an idea that the independence of America would be the work of this generation, for people yet had a confidence in the integrity of the British monarch. It was, Drayton insisted, even so late as the latter end of the last year before that confidence visibly declined, with the royal sword yet reeking with American blood and the king still deaf to the prayers of the people for peace, liberty, and safety. Up until the very end, it was thought that the monarch, from motives of policy, if not from inclination, would heal our wounds and thereby prevent the separation. But Americans didn't simply turn against their own king, their own particular king, in the early months of 1776. In shockingly large numbers, they turned suddenly and definitively against kingship itself. Contemporaries were equally quick to underline the drama and unexpectedness of this parallel development, and they attributed it uniformly to the extraordinary influence of a single pamphlet published in January of 1776, Tom Paine's Common Sense. In April of that year, George Washington observed in a letter to Joseph Reed that, quote, my countrymen, I know from their form of government and steady attachment heretofore to royalty, will come reluctantly into the idea of independency. But in letters which I have lately received from Virginia, I find common sense is working a powerful change there in the minds of many men. The loyalist governor of New Jersey, William Franklin, son of Benjamin, likewise observed in a March 28th letter to Lord German that, quote, the minds of a great number of people have been much changed in that respect, that is, concerning whether to adopt an independency, as he put it, since the publication of a most inflammatory pamphlet in which this horrid measure is strongly and artfully recommended. Franklin, accordingly, enclosed a copy of Common Sense for German's perusal. Ramsey agreed with these early assessments, emphasizing one particular aspect of Paine's performance in order to account for its transformative impact on the colonial debate. This is how he put it. With the view of operating on the sentiments of a religious people, scripture was pressed into his service, that is, into Paine's, and the powers and even the name of a king was rendered odious in the eyes of numerous colonists who had read and studied the history of the Jews, as recorded in the Old Testament. The folly of that people in revolting from a government instituted by heaven itself and the oppressions to which they were subjected in consequence of their lusting after kings to rule over them afforded an excellent handle for prepossessing the colonists in favor of republican institutions and prejudicing them against kingly government. So Paine, on Ramsey's account, had provoked an unprecedented wave of anti-monarchism throughout British America by pressing scripture into his service and convincing a religious people conversant with the history of the Jews that God regarded the institution of kingship as sinful and illicit. Interestingly, Ramsey was not remotely alone in offering this diagnosis nor was his judgment simply a matter of hindsight. In an extraordinary letter dated April 26th uh, of 76, which I managed to unearth uh, thanks entirely to a tip uh, from the great Jack Rakove, the Virginia planter and jurist Richard Parker reported to his close friend Richard Henry Lee on the character of the newspaper debate that had been sparked by the release of Paine's pamphlet. I observe, he wrote, the Pennsylvania papers are filled with the controversy about independence and think the, ri the writers have rather left the question. What matters it to us at present whether monarchy is reprobated by the Almighty or not? In other words, while the controversy may have begun as a debate about the expediency or inexpediency of independence, in his words, that is about whether George III had in fact irreparably forfeited the allegiance of his American subjects, it had quickly turned into a scriptural debate over the theological permissibility of monarchy itself. As Parker went on to explain, Paine had written extensively about, quote, monarchical government as established amongst the Jews, and had argued that God was displeased with their demanding a king and was determined that they should suffer for this crime. <coughs> 
The Massachusetts minister, Peter Whitney, discussing that incomparable pamphlet called Common Sense in 76, reflected that, quote, new truths are often struck out by the collision of parties in the eagerness of controversy, which otherwise would have lain hid. The divine disapprobation of a form of government by kings I take to be one of this sort of truths. Paine's earliest critics agreed fully with these assessments. The author of an anonymous reply to Common Sense, published in Dublin in 76, blisteringly described how Paine ransacks the scriptures for texts against kingly government and with a faculty of perverting sacred truths to the worst of purposes, peculiar to gentlemen of his disposition, quotes the example of the Jews. This critic revealingly chose a line of Shakespeare for his pamphlet's epigraph. The devil can cite scripture for his purpose. But unlike Whitney, several of Paine's opponents recognized that the scriptural argument against monarchy featured in common sense was not, in fact, new. In deploying it, they observed, Paine was reopening a long dormant 17th century debate. One of his English respondents noted that, quote, his scripture politics are superannuated and obsolete in these countries by a hundred years. Good Whigs, according to a prominent American critic, desired to leave scripture out of the institution of modern governments. It might be well, he wrote, for the author of Common Sense to follow the example in his future works without stirring up an old dispute of which our fathers were long since wearied. This old dispute concerning the divine acceptability of monarchy, the author continued, had animated the likes of Hugo Grotius and Algernon Sidney. It had concerned the proper interpretation of a crucial biblical text, Deuteronomy 17, and had sent 17th century theorists in search of, quote, how the Jews commonly understood this chapter. A third critic likewise un insisted on the 17th century provenance of Paine's argument, dating it to that period, as he wrote, to which the soul of our author yearns, the death of Charles I. England groaned under the most cruel tyranny of a government truly military, neither existing by law or the choice of the people, but erected by those who in the name of the Lord committed crimes till then unheard of. We have from English history, the author explained, sufficient proof that saints of his disposition, though more eager to grasp at power than any other set of men, have a thousand times recited the same texts by which he attempts to level all distinctions. Cromwell, the father of them, knew their aversion so well to the name of king that he would never assume it, though he exercised a power despotic as the Persian Sophie. But the precise genealogy of Paine's argument in common sense comes to us, in fact, from the man himself. Late in life, John Adams recalled a conversation that he had with Paine about his pamphlet in 1776. I told him further, he writes, that his reasoning from the Old Testament was ridiculous, and I could hardly think him sincere. At this he laughed and said he had taken his ideas in that part from Milton and then expressed a contempt of the Old Testament and indeed of the Bible at large, which surprised me. Well, however reluctant we might be, rightly reluctant, to credit Adam's retrospective testimony about Paine's early religious views, that is, the temptation to project Paine's later deism back onto his younger self may just have proven irresistible, his claim about the Miltonic origins of Paine's scriptural argument against monarchy is worth taking extremely seriously, not least because it is obviously correct. The section of common sense on monarchy and hereditary succession is indeed a straightforward paraphrase of Milton's argument in the Pro Populo Anglicano Defensio of 1651, his first defense of the English people. In this text, Milton had turned to a rabbinic tradition, a radical tradition of rabbinic biblical commentary, in order to explain why God became angry with the Israelites when they requested a king in 1 Samuel 8, this despite his apparent acceptance of kingly government 
in Deuteronomy 17. Remember, in Deuteronomy 17, God says to the people, look, when you enter the land of Israel, you're going to say, let us have a king. And he goes on to say something like, well, that seems to be fine, but just make sure it's the right kind of king. And he goes on to, uh, to set some conditions. So it seems as if, in principle, he's okay with monarchy. Uh, but then when they ask for one in uh, 1 Samuel 8, he and Samuel both get very angry. And so the, the challenge for exegetes always was to try to harmonize uh, these two uh, seemingly uh, divergent biblical passages. Uh, and the most common way of putting them together was to argue that actually the sin in 1 Samuel 8 is not the sin of asking for a monarch per se, but simply the sin of asking for the wrong kind of monarch, a monarch like all the other nations, uh, or asking for one at the wrong time. Dif differing uh, versions of this were around, but that's basically the view. Uh, but rejecting this traditional view, that God had disapproved only of the sort of king that his people had requested, Milton argued instead that the Israelites had sinned in asking for a king of any sort, because monarchy per se is an instance of the sin of idolatry. The wisest rabbis, he explained, quote, deny that their fathers should have recognized any king but God, though such a king was given to punish them. I follow the opinion of these rabbis. On his telling, as he puts it, God indeed gives evidence throughout of his great displeasure at the Israelites' request for a king. Thus, in 1 Samuel 8, he quotes the passage, they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them according to all the works which they have done wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods. That's God speaking to Samuel. The meaning, he continues, is that it is a form of idolatry to ask for a king who demands that he be worshipped and granted honors like those of a god. God, accordingly, had punished the people by granting their sinful request. I gave thee a king in mine anger, as Hosea puts it, and took him away in my wrath. The Israelites would endure great suffering under their kings until at last they were led into captivity. In making this argument, Milton ushered in a new kind of Republican political theory, which quickly became ubiquitous among defenders of the English Commonwealth in the 1650s. This Hebraizing doctrine, as I'll call it, was very different indeed from the heavily Roman theory of free states that had animated parliamentarians in the 1640s. For neo-Roman theorists, the great worry was discretionary power. A free man, they argued, must be sui juris, governed by his own right or according to his own right. He must not be dependent on the will of another, which these writers took to mean based on a freestanding set of claims about the theory of representation, that he must be governed only by laws made by a popular assembly and not by the arbitrary will, as they put it, of a single person. On this account, kingship is certainly not a necessary institution, and indeed, neo-Roman defenses of republican government were quite common throughout the early modern period. But it is nonetheless an entirely permissible one so long as the monarch is a pure executive, entrusted with the task of enforcing law, but invested with no prerogative powers by which he may make law, particularly the negative voice, uh, that is the veto, or govern subjects without law. For Hebraizing theorists such as Milton, who embraced what I will call an exclusivist commitment to Republican government, the great worry was instead the status of kingship, not the particular powers traditionally wielded by kings. In assigning a human being the title and dignity of a king, they argued, we rebel against our heavenly king and bow down instead to an idol of flesh and blood. As the regicide John Cook had put it in Monarchy No Creature of God's Making of 1652, majesty is a term not fit for any mortal man because higher than that we cannot give. It is the idolatrous usurpation of a godlike state. Whether kings be good men or bad, I will punish the people, says the Lord, so long as they have any kings. It is not a government of my ordination. Kings are the people's idols, creatures of their own making. So the exclusivist position elaborated by these English authors embodied a categorical rejection of the status of monarchy and the kingly office. 
Its central preoccupation was not discretionary power, as I've said, but rather the idolatrous pretension of assigning royal dignity to a mere mortal who, in Milton's words, pageants himself up and down in progress among the perpetual bowings and cringings of an abject people on either side deifying and adoring him. It was therefore both more and less radical than its neo-Roman rival. More radical in that it denied the legitimacy of all monarchies, however limited. Less radical in that it left open the possibility of an extremely powerful chief magistrate, so long as he was not called king. It did not, like the standard parliamentarian theory, require government by a representative assembly. We can put the contrast between these two positions as follows. The neo-Roman theory anathematized prerogative while remaining agnostic about kings, whereas the Hebraizing exclusivist theory anathematized kings while remaining agnostic about prerogative. In the aftermath of the Glorious Revolution, Whigs emphatically rejected the Hebraizing view as well as the biblical exegesis upon which it had been based. They offered instead a straightforwardly neo-Roman reading of 1 Samuel 8, according to which the Israelites had sinned, not in asking for a king per se, but in asking for a king with sweeping prerogative powers, that is, for asking for a non-Whig king. Uh, this Whig reading was given its classic formulation in Roger Acherley's The Britannic Constitution of 1727. Uh, and Acherley's complaint uh, is that all these people are going and reading about what he calls the Jewish economy and concluding that the monarchy they see depicted in 1 Samuel uh, is just monarchy. Uh, it's the only uh, form of it that one could imagine. But this, he argues, is to commit a grave error. The Israelites could have chosen the free and limited monarchy that God desired for them, but instead they rejected God by demanding arbitrary kings. Quote, if they would have a king like all the nations, of which Egypt was one, then they must be in the like subjection and slavery as people of those nations were, which differed not from the bondage that was Egyptian. Whereas, if they had desired a king to protect and defend their liberties and properties, the request had been commendable. Samuel was therefore amazed at this people's importunity, not only to reject the greatest blessings God could give or they enjoy, viz. liberty and property, but to return again unto slavery. And he accordingly warned the Israelites that, quote, the power of such a king as they desired, viz. of a king like all the nations about them, would be arbitrary and that the liberty of their persons and the properties of their estates would necessarily fall under his absolute will and disposal after the manner they had formerly been in Egypt. Such a king would have in him the whole legislative and judicial power, and this arbitrary will and pleasure would be the law or measure by which his government would be administered. So for actually, the Israelites had sinned in asking for a monarch who would combine executive, legislative, and judicial power in violation of Whig principles, that is, one who would govern by his arbitrary will and pleasure. Once again, it was discretionary power, not the kingly title or office, that God was said to despise. To the extent that British North Americans discussed biblical monarchy at all during the first 12 years of the imperial crisis, it was simply to affirm this traditional understanding. God, on this account, permitted each people to choose its form of government, and he had no objection whatsoever to the institution of monarchy. All participants in the pamphlet debates leading up to the revolution could endorse this formulation, although it must be stressed that pamphlets of the 60s and 70s uh, tended to ignore scripture altogether before 76. Indeed, as the crisis escalated in 75, even the very small number of colonial writers and ministers who began to offer a Republican reading of 1 Samuel 8, and I'm thinking here of people like Harvard Samuel Langdon and the Connecticut minister Dan Foster, did so while continuing to insist upon the legitimacy and divine permissibility of monarchy. They followed their parliamentarian predecessors in arguing simply that Republican government would offer the best protection against arbitrary discretionary power, that it would rescue them once and for all from the dangers of the encroaching prerogative and was therefore better, choice worthy, uh, but not exclusively licit or legitimate. Their writings from this 12 month period therefore provide a fascinating glimpse of a road not taken 
of what the Republican turn might have looked like had Paine not published his pamphlet. But in fact, he did publish it. And seen in the context of these earlier discussions, common sense emerges as a transformative intervention. Rejecting over a century of Whig biblical exegesis, Paine unambiguously returned in January of 76 to Milton and the Hebraic exclusivists of the 1650s. His argument in the section of monarchy and hereditary succession reads as follows. Government by kings was first introduced into the world by the heathens from whom the children of Israel copied the custom. It was the most prosperous invention the devil ever set on foot for the promotion of idolatry. The heathens paid divine honors to their deceased kings, and the Christian world hath improved on the plan by doing the same to their living ones. How impious is the title of sacred majesty applied to a worm who in the midst of his splendor is crumbling into dust. Near 3,000 years passed away from the Mosaic account of the creation till the Jews, under a national delusion, requested a king. Till then, their form of government, except in extraordinary cases where the Almighty interposed, was a kind of republic, administered by a judge and the elders of the tribes. Kings had they none, and it was held sinful to acknowledge any being under that title but the Lord of hosts. And when a man seriously reflects on the idolatrous homage which is paid to the persons of kings, he need not wonder that the Almighty, ever jealous of his honor, should disapprove a form of government which so impiously invades the prerogatives of heaven. For pain, as for Milton before him, the Israelites had sinned in asking for a king per se. As he puts it, monarchy is ranked in scripture as one of the sins of the Jews, for which a curse in reserve is denounced against them. These portions of scripture, he tells us, are direct and positive. They admit of no equivocal construction. The issue was not the sort of king for which the Israelites had asked, an arbitrary queen, a king whose prerogative powers would enslave them, or that they had asked for one despite being under God's unique providential government at the time, as a second uh, early modern reading had suggested. On the contrary, they sin because it is inherently idolatrous to assign any human being the title and status of king. The Almighty, on Paine's account, hath here entered his protest against monarchical government as such. And when the Israelites later entreated Gideon to become their king, the judge and prophet, quote, denieth their right to establish a monarchy and accordingly charges them with disaffection to their proper sovereign, the king of heaven. The claim about denying their right is the crucial one. Remember, the Whig story is uh, God says to pe the people, you can choose whatever form of government you like. Perhaps I have a preference, say a Republican constitution, but it's up to you as long as you don't choose uh, arbitrary, tyrannical, or despotic government. Here, Paine is saying that God denieth their right uh, to institute monarchy of any kind. So it's off the table because it's idolatrous. Now, Paine's opponents, not all of them loyalists, fully recognized the radicalism of this position as well as its tendency to shift the focus of conversation away from potentially enslaving kingly powers and toward the alleged evils of the very title of king. Paine himself, after all, had gone out of his way in the pamphlet to insist that the English monarchy was illicit despite being virtually powerless. As he put it, quote, if we inquire into the business of a king, we shall find that in some countries they have none. And after sauntering away their lives without pleasure to themselves or advantage to the nation, withdraw from the scene and leave their successors to tread the same idle round. In absolute monarchy, the whole weight of the business, civil and military, lies on the king. The children of Israel, in their request for a king, urged this plea that he may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. But in countries where he is neither a judge nor a general, as in England, a man would be puzzled to know what is his business. Indeed, the anonymous author of the Dublin pamphlet that I mentioned zeroes in on precisely this issue in his response. The danger of Paine's position on this view is that it encourages colonial readers to become anxious about precisely the wrong things, to pursue shadow over substance. So long as their chief magistrate is not called king, 
they will feel that the relevant political principles have been satisfied fully. They will not fret at all about the sweeping prerogative powers that their suitably rechristened governors might come to wield. In the case of the English, as he puts it, Cromwell knew so well the people's aversion to the name of king that he would never assume it. He knew it would make him odious to those who had overturned the state. He knew they were acquainted with the extent of royal prerogative, though not of kingly power. It's a striking passage. So what he's saying is, look, the Englishmen of the 1650s were happy to suffer the evils of the royal prerogative so long as the putatively idolatrous name of king had been abolished. Likewise, as he puts it, the Prince of Orange, though in Holland called Stadtholder, yet exercised royal authority in its full extent. But in England, where he was acknowledged king, he's talking here, of course, about William III, his authority was more circumscribed, so that in other parts of Europe, he was wittily called the King of Holland and the Stadtholder of England. The royal powers wielded by William III as Stadtholder of the United Provinces were far more sweeping than any he enjoyed as King of Great Britain. Yet Payne and his ilk would have us believe that the god of freedom reprobates the latter and not the former. As another critic put the point, it is trifling to find fault with the term. The harm lies not in the four letters K-I-N-G. As Parker testified to Lee in the letter I cited earlier, the controversy over Paine's scriptural argument likewise came to dominate the extensive debate over common sense in the Philadelphia newspapers, uh, a debate about which Nathan Pearl Rosenthal has recently written with great skill. Here, the most substantial critique of the Hebraic exclusivist position came from the Reverend William Smith, the Anglican provost of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, writing under the pseudonym Cato, Smith took it as self-evident that Paine had perverted the scripture in claiming that, as he puts it, monarchy, meaning probably the institution of monarchy, is ranked in scripture as one of the sins of the Jews for which a curse and reserve is denounced against them. But he recognized that in a country in which God be thanked, the scriptures are read and regarded with that reverence which is due to a revelation from heaven, the argument of common sense simply had to be answered. One couldn't safely ignore it. So out he charges to answer pain. His project, as he says, is to rescue out of our author's hands that portion of the sacred history which he has converted into a libel against the civil constitution of Great Britain and show in what sense the passage has been universally received as well by the Jews themselves as by commentators, venerable for their piety and learning in every Christian country. He begins by reminding his readers that, quote, the Jews were long privileged with a peculiar form of government called a theocracy, under which the Almighty either stirred up some person by an immediate signification of his will to be their judge, or when there was none, ruled his proceed their proceedings himself. When the Israelites requested a human king, they sinned first and foremost, as he says, in rejecting that divine government under which they had prospered. But they sinned yet again in desiring a king to judge them like all the nations. Here we come back to the old view. That is, what was the sin? Asking for the wrong kind of king. Since all the nations which they knew were ruled by kings whose arbitrary will stood in the place of law. And it appears also that the Jews, since the day that they were brought out of Egypt, had still retained a particular hankering after the customs of that country. God, therefore, not only signifies his displeasure against all such arbitrary rulers, but against every people who would impiously and foolishly prefer such a government to one immediately under himself, where in his providence he might fit, think fit to appoint such a one. So there were the two problems. Problem number one was asking for a change of government when God himself was ruling you in this providentially designed way. So that was impious and sedition. Uh, but... Error number two was then, having decided to ask for a king, you asked for the wrong kind. But Paine, uh, as Smith summarizes, had dared to argue, in virtue of this, that the Almighty hath here entered his protest against monarchical government as such. Smith answers firstly that, quote, the Almighty would have as strongly expressed his displeasure against the Jews had they rejected his government for one of their own appointment, whether it had been monarchical or democratical, to be administered by one man or a thousand men. 
But Paine errs most spectacularly in assuming that when Samuel described the horrors that would be perpetrated by Israelite kings, the prophet meant to extend his protest against all future monarchical governments, such as were to subsist some thousands of years afterwards, however limited and mixed, particularly that of Great Britain, which must certainly be the author's meaning, or he proves nothing to his purpose. This, for Smith, is just patently absurd. Citing actually in his Britannic constitutions, as he puts it, he insists that the particular case of the Jews cannot be applied to any other nation in this instance, as none else were ever in similar circumstances. And in order to buttress that conclusion, he turns to the Hebrew text itself, as well as to the tradition of Jewish commentary upon it. First comes the celebrated Grotius, as he calls him, uh, who tells us that Samuel in this passage does not speak of what our author calls the general manner of kings. This is, remember, the passage in 1 Samuel where when the people ask for a king, uh, Samuel warns them off by predicting all the terrible things that their kings are going to do. So uh, what, uh, what Cato is pointing out is that in this passage on Grotius's account, uh, Samuel is not speaking about the general manner of kings, or the just and honest right of a king to do such things because his right is otherwise described elsewhere, that is, in Deuteronomy 17. The prophet only speaks of such a right as the kings round about Israel had acquired, which was not a true right, for such is not the signification of the original word mishpat. But such an action, as being founded in might and violence, hath the effectum juris, or comes in the place of right. Grotius is then said to be well warranted in this interpretation, not only by the Hebrew text, but other clear passages of scripture, and particularly the 17th chapter of Deuteronomy, where with the approbation of heaven, the duty of a good king is described and limited. Smith proceeds to summarize the rabbinic debate over this passage as it had inflected the 17th century controversy over monarchy, and the fact that he still remembers all this time afterwards, uh, the degree to which the rabbinic sources had organized the earlier 17th century debate and which sources had been on what side is actually a very striking fact about this exchange. Uh, so as he puts it, the Jews commonly understood this chapter, that is Deuteronomy 17, as containing an absolute promise from heaven of a royal government and a sufficient authority for the request made to Samuel more than 300 years afterwards. Others understood it conditionally that if they did reject the divine government and set up one of their own appointment, God would permit them, but their king should be one chosen in the manner and with the qualifications uh, in the chapter described. All this, however, they disregarded when they asked an arbitrary king, like those of their neighboring nations, and therefore it is demonstrably certain that Samuel, in entering his protest against such kings, did not protest against kings or monarchical governments generally. Either this remark is true, or one part of scripture is a direct contradiction to the other. And that would be bad. The rabbis of the Talmud, here simply the Jews in Smith's account, unlike the rabbis cited by Milton, had indeed derived from Deuteronomy 17 an absolute promise of monarchy, that is, an affirmative commandment to ask for a king. Others, on Smith's account, had construed the text to embody a permission to establish a virtuous and lawful monarchy. Both readings converge in insisting that the Israelites sinned only in asking for the wrong sort of king. Smith conveniently neglects to mention that another group of rabbis, along with their early modern expositors, had taken precisely Paine's view of the matter, or rather he had taken theirs. These are the ones cited by Milton. For Smith, as for the rest of Paine's critics in 76, the Hebraizing argument of common sense was most dangerous because it allowed tyrannical wolves to masquerade as Republican sheep. The popular leaders who overturned the monarchy in the last age, he reminds his readers, were not themselves friends to republics. They only made use of the name to procure the favor of the people. And whenever by such means they had mounted to the proper height, each of them in his turn began to kick the people from him as a ladder then useless. Once again, the embodiment of this danger is Oliver Cromwell. <coughs> Cromwell, as Smith puts it, exercised the power of a king and of the most absolute king under the specious name of a protector. 
the instrument of republican government, which he had at first extolled as the most perfect work of human invention, he began, as soon as he thought his authority sufficiently established, to represent as a rotten plank upon which no man could trust himself without sinking. He had his eyes fixed upon the crown, but when he procured an offer of it from a packed parliament, his courage failed him. He had outwitted himself by his own hypocrisy, and in, this, and in his way to power had thrown such an odium upon the name of the king that his own family, apprehensive he would be murdered at the moment the diadem should touch his brow, persuaded him to decline that honor. The Miltonic argument, revived by pain, threatened to make a fetish out of the name of king on this account delivering the colonists instead into the arbitrary power of a non-monarchical tyrant. True republics, on this view, are defined by the absence of discretionary power in any single person, not by the lack of an allegedly idolatrous title. Now, none of these critics succeeded in blunting the impact of Paine's pamphlet. It had sold over 100,000 copies by April of 76, making it, without question, the most frequently printed pamphlet of the revolutionary era. And the crucial section of monarchy and hereditary succession was reprinted or excerpted in a host of newspapers throughout the colonies. And as we have seen, uh, it was also substantially reproduced in each of the many critical responses to pain, which in turn themselves uh, enjoyed a wide readership. The literary remains of the year amply confirm David Ramsey's recollection that thanks to common sense, quote, the name of a king was rendered odious to a vast number of Americans. Writing in April to Lee in the letter I mentioned, uh, Lee uh, was described by Landon Carter as a prodigious admirer, if not partly a writer in the pamphlet Common Sense. Parker offered a detailed commentary on the exchange between Cato and Paine. If you will give me leave, he began, I will show you my sentiments of monarchical government as established amongst the Jews. The heathen nations surrounding them had paid divine honors to their kings, just quoting Paine, and the Lord, being a jealous God, took every means to prevent them from falling into the same error. Yet he was rebuffed, and the subsequent depredations of the Israelite kings provide evidence of his great anger. Can it be thought the Almighty would have been so unmerciful to his people if it had not been to show them the impropriety of having a king for whose trespasses they were to suffer? After all, God has expressly declared to them long before they asked a king that they would do it and that he would punish them with the kings they should set over them. Hosea in the 13th chapter says, I gave thee a king in mine anger and took him away in my wrath. In short, God was displeased with their demanding a king and was determined that they should suffer for this crime. To be sure, uh, as Parker adds, Cato thinks he has defeated common sense by producing a few texts of scripture to show God was no enemy to monarchical government but rather approved of it. But Parker answers, taking Paine's side, that, quote, God has expressly declared his displeasure with the Jews for asking a king, but he knew long before they did demand one that they would do it and what sort they should choose, and he declares how he ought to conduct himself and by which conduct he should obtain his favor. It is a pity, Parker concludes, that Cato hath not the candor to compare the scripture, a, compare, uh, a crime he accuses common sense of. A host of writers from throughout the colonies echoed Parker's sentiments over the next six months. Peter Whitney of Massachusetts, whom we've already met, uh, argued in a sermon preached on September 12th that when the people of Israel foolishly and impiously asked God to give them a king, Samuel begged them to reconsider. Yet they, notwithstanding, persisted in their demand, and God gave them a king, but in his anger and as a great scourge and curse to them. Whitney's verdict on this episode is once again an extended paraphrase of pain interspersed with direct quotations from the pamphlet that I won't read out here, because you've already heard them. Uh, the most high over all the earth, Whitney concludes, gave kings at first to the Jews as he sends war in anger and as a judgment. And it may be affirmed that upon the whole, they have been a scourge to the inhabitants of the earth ever since. 
Whitney's view was endorsed the following month in the instruction to delegates published by the Committee for Charlotte County, Virginia. Having renounced their allegiance to George III, the citizens of the county were now committed, quote, to taking the God of heaven to be our king. A sermon preached in Boston by Benjamin Hitchborn took the same line. Quote, I am inclined to think that the great founder of societies has caused the curse of infatuating ambition and relentless cruelty to be entailed on those whose vanity may lead them to assume his prerogative among any of his people as they are cantoned about in the world, and to prevent mankind from paying that adoration and respect to the most dignified mortal, which is due only to infinite goodness and wisdom in the direction of almighty power and therefore that he alone is fit to be a monarch. Nor did the passing of the years diminish Paine's grip on the political imagination of British Americans. In 78, the poet Philip Freno echoed common sense in verse this way. To recommend what monarchies have done, they bring for witness David and his son, and hence our plain republics they despise. But mark how oft to gratify their pride the people suffered and the people died. Though one was wise and one Goliath slew, kings are the choicest curse that man e'er knew. Well, it isn't Milton, but there, there you are. Uh, John Murray of Newburyport returned to this theme finally in his sermon celebrating the Peace of Paris and the birth of the new United States in 1784. Now hail thy deliverer God, he exhorts his audience. Worship without fear of man. This day invite him to the crown of America. Proclaim him king of the land. Such a coronation, he goes on to explain, has been made possible by the great virtue of Americans and their leaders. In the Hebrew Republic of old, as he tells the story, following pain, Gideon was invited to become king, but he recognized that, quote, the reins of kingly authority become no hands other than those of the all-perfect sovereign of the universe. Only God is fit to sit monarch on a throne. Before him only, every knee should bow. At his feet should sceptered mortals cast their crowns. There should they lay them down in, to resume and wear them no more forever. And he who refuses this rightful homage to the only supreme deserves to be treated as a tyrant among men and a rebel against God. Why should Americans expect any less of their own greatest general than the Israelites were allowed to expect from Gideon? Uh, as Murray puts it, are we not too the children of Israel, a professing covenant people in a land peculiarly privileged with gospel light? Indeed we are. And though Washington was never offered a crown because for Americans, quote, the idea of a human monarchy is too absurd in itself, if he had been, he surely would have replied in ringing tones that the Lord alone shall be king of America. The uniformly rapturous reception of common sense in the 1780s should not cause us to lose sight of the fierce debate that it provoked in the late 1770s. Paine's argument, as we've seen, was by no means greeted with universal acclaim. Loyalists fiercely resisted his conclusions and even many patriots found his reasoning deeply uncongenial, most particularly the scriptural argument against monarchy. But even Paine's most dogged critics recognized the power and impact of his intervention. One of them, a Philadelphia writer who published in the Pennsylvania Ledger under the pseudonym Moderator, categorically rejected Paine's argument for independence, believing instead that, as he put it, a, a reconciliation with Great Britain upon constitutional principles is the most certain foundation for American happiness. But moderator also offered an extraordinary account of how Paine's anti-monarchical rhetoric had quite literally captured his imagination for a time. This is what he says. When the pamphlet called Common Sense first appeared, I found myself staggered with the high-wrought declamations against monarchy in general and of Britain in particular. I viewed the royal brute with an indignant frown and began to new mold my monarchical sentiments into those of a commonwealth whose virtue should reign triumphant and vice be expelled from the land. I read it a second time with more deliberation and uninfluenced by those impressions which are generally made by novelty. For I am one of those who have a wonderful aptitude to be smitten with anything that is grand, a lake, 
a mountain, a temple, or a capacious thought that includes a thousand words, immediately captivate my fancy. It instantly gets upon the wing, ranges with delight through the extensive scene, and forgets for a moment the real objects about me. Such had been my situation of mind when I surrendered the reins of my imagination to the guidance of the ingenious author of Common Sense. We soared aloft into the wilds of fancy, the dull beaten tracks of monarchy we left far behind us, and found a republic amidst the stars. And though the sun might seem to admiring mortals below the grand monarch of the heavenly bodies, yet we found other suns and other worlds innumerable who might only be considered as presidents, not monarchs, of the vast system. Everywhere shone a republic, the various constellations which enspangle the sky united upon the principles of perfect equality and gravitating toward each other with wonderful adjustment, mutually attracted and mutually repelled. Thus, gentle reader, was my imagination led captive with fiery velocity. In due course, uh, moderator explained that he had returned like Noah's dove to dry ground and realized that pain was full of it. But he nonetheless vividly recalled the sublimity of the journey on which Paine had taken him. He had been persuaded, however fleetingly, to leave behind the dull beaten tracks of monarchy, to recognize that just as the sun itself is a mere president in the eyes of the creator of the vast system of the universe and no grand monarch of the heavenly bodies, so too there is no human king on earth who is fit to be styled king. Whatever the delusions of admiring mortals below, God is the only true monarch. Unlike moderator, however, the majority of British North Americans never came back down to earth. They thoroughly absorbed Paine's Hebraizing exclusivist argument against kingship, rendering it virtually unthinkable that an American monarchy would be established at the conclusion of the Revolutionary War. But it was precisely because Paine had so effectively altered the focus of political debate from the enslaving effects of kingly powers to the idolatrous pretensions of the office of king, that it later became possible for Americans to reconcile republicanism with prerogative. Looking back on the period of the founding in old age, John Adams shared the following vignette with a correspondent. The Prince of Orange, William V, in a conversation with which he honored me in 1788, was pleased to say that he had read our new constitution, and he added, Monsieur, vous allez avoir un roi sous le titre du président, which may be translated, sir, you have given yourselves a king under the title of president. Turgot, Rochefoucauld, and Condorcet, Brissot, and Robespierre were all offended that we had given too much éclat to our governors and presidents. It is true, and I rejoice in it, that our presidents, limited as they are, have more power, that is, more executive power, than the Stadtholders, the Doges, the Podestas, or the Archons, or the Kings of Lacedaemon or of Poland. Indeed, Adams had observed as early as 1789 that, quote, I know of no first magistrate in any Republican government excepting England who possesses a constitutional dignity, authority, and power comparable to his, that is, the president's. His prerogatives and dignities are so transcendent that they must naturally and necessarily excite in the nation all the jealousy, envy, fears, apprehension, and apposition that are so constantly observed in England against the crown. Once the title of king had been abolished in accordance with the demands of scripture, Americans were eventually able to make their peace with kingly power. Let us now consider what our constitution is, Adams wrote, and see whether any name can with propriety be given it than that of a monarchical republic, or if you will, a limited monarchy. Montesquieu had famously characterized England as a republic disguised under the form of a monarchy. Thanks in large part to the Hebraizing turn initiated by pain, the new United States would become the reverse. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Step over here, and we'll see. Perhaps there are some uh, questions. Yes. Um, I'm a French historian, so my American history is shaky on details, but uh, how does uh, your research fit in with the standard story that George Washington was actually offered a throne? Is that, is that a myth that is uh, to be dismissed on, on the basis of your research, or 
or was that an actual possibility? And if so, to what extent did uh, the material that, that you discussed enter into that debate? Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, the, 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 uh, the point about uh, the offer to Washington uh, I mean, remains a, a sort of controversial point uh, among historians, and there's, uh, and it was controversial at the time. That is, there was a great deal of um, uh, of rumor uh, at the time. Uh, great, um, uh, so a number of people who were anti-federalists. Um, to I mean, the term is not particularly helpful, but in, in this context, uh, opponents of the Constitution. A number um, circulated, uh, you know, quite. Uh, frantic rumors uh, that actually uh, the the convention in Philadelphia was dominated by monarchists who were uh, who were attempting to engineer a return of hereditary monarchy uh, and that this might be offered to Washington. Uh, there were various people who wrote to Washington uh, to hint that he should uh, consider taking up a crown. Um, it was never uh, formally offered. Uh, but certainly it was in the air uh, as a possibility and as something that people feared, although never really, um, let's say, a live possibility, uh, I think, is the consensus. But you know, there, there, um, uh, there isn't all that much that's been written recently on this. So there, this was a, a major subject uh, in the 19-teens, 20s, uh, for where, you know, in which excellent scholars wrote about uh, the sort of legs of monarchical tendencies in the early republic. Uh, the most recent um, uh, contribution of the kind is uh, a, a piece by Gordon Wood in which he talks about the sort of pageantry uh, that arose around the presidency uh, that had this very fraught uh, interaction with monarchical traditions, obviously things like State of the Union addresses and, and so on. Uh, but, uh, but to be sure, um, it was a sort of commonplace uh, in the period uh, and in the convention. It was sort of just taken for granted by everybody uh, that at this point, uh, monarchy was not a live possibility, that people would not accept uh, a monarchy and that that was just something uh, that had to be taken as sort of baked in and given and then worked around to some degree, either welcomed or worked around depending on who was doing the talking. But, um, uh, but yeah, so I mean, there, 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 there certainly were people who wrote to Washington uh, to uh, hint to him that he should be prepared to do this. Uh, but it was, uh, and uh, there, there are debates about um, uh, how likely it would have been uh, had he expressed an interest. Um, uh, that would have brought the debate out into the in a very, very different way, absolutely. Um, and uh, you know, because the, the the figure of Washington was so important uh, in arguing about um, the creation of the executive in general. That is, um, you know, should he have a veto? Should he have a life term? Should he um, uh, should he have term limits? Uh, a number. You know, one of the reasons that um, uh, term limits uh, were not required. Um, uh, or you know, people dropped their insistence that there should be term limits in some of these cases. It was clearly because um, they trusted Washington. So it was a lot of it was just um, uh, uh, you know unfolding in his shadow in a very important way. Uh, but it doesn't seem uh, that anyone thought uh, there would be public appetite uh, for the institution of a hereditary monarchy uh, at that point. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's a great question. I mean, the, the um, 
I, I'd say a couple of things about it. One is, uh, one of the things that actually surprised me, uh, having done some of this research now, is that, I mean, to the extent that, um, uh, that people have talked at all about this debate uh, on biblical monarchy and the sort of use of ideas about the Hebrew Republic or the, uh, the Jewish Commonwealth, as they sometimes called it, um, in 75-6. Um, it has, to the extent that people have talked about it, they've thought of it um, as, a, as a New England phenomenon. I mean, it's really, these are just kind of New England ministers uh, who, are, who are talking. And one of the extraordinary facts is um, uh, that it turns out that that's false. I mean, that the, the legs of this discourse were really considerable, such that you could find a Virginia planter uh, like Richard Parker uh, writing to uh, Richard Henry Lee uh, about this uh, in 76, and that Washington could talk about you know, the change that it's working in Virginia uh, and in North Carolina and other places. In other words, the, uh, the idea that this is just a kind of uh, eccentric preoccupation of these you know, New England ministers who might be predisposed to thinking in New Israel terms. Um, turns out not to be true. And I guess that's the second thing I'd say, and then I'll say a third. Second thing is, um, the idea, the, the sort of new Israel idea, um, which is obviously a, a hugely powerful one, and, and uh, I, I won't be able to get into it uh, in any detail now, but certainly um, this uh, kind of typological understanding uh, in which American history is a kind of reenactment uh, of biblical history, you know, goes back to William Bradford and so on. Um, and uh, you could imagine uh, a way in which the new Israel um, uh, kind of tapas might have blunted uh, the radicalism of this particular kind of anti-monarchism. Because if you say, look, we're the new Israel, then uh, we can say we're a special case. Right? And if God didn't want Israel to have monarchs, he might be perfectly happy for everybody else to have them. There might just be reasons why uh, his chosen nation uh, that stands in this elect relation to him shouldn't have them. Uh, so that was a way out for, uh, for um, defenders of monarchy. Uh, as I tried to suggest, you could say, look, this was just special about Israel. And so the most that you would be saying if you said, uh, we're the new Israel, is just that you, being the new Israel, supposing you're right that you are, should not have kings. Um, but you know, it's striking that they don't do that. That is, although he talks about the new Israel, the argument is general. That is, it's simply a sin for any human being in any context to, uh, to be given um, uh, these, uh, these titles, prerogatives, this status. Um, so uh, so that's, that's the second thing. And the third, it gets to your point, th there is no question that um, New Testament uh, examples are much less common in this discourse as they had been in the 17th century. Uh, there, were, uh, there were, of course, verses from the Gospels uh, and the epistles that featured very prominently in different kinds of debates. Uh, about, you know, just to take a, an obvious example, debates about resistance, uh, political resistance. But uh, one of the reasons for the turn to the Hebrew sources in the first place was just that, uh, as uh, all of the 17th century uh, writers repeated over and over again, Jesus gave no law. That is, he did not found a polity. And so, you know, if you want to know what God thinks about political science, um, that is, you know, what kind of state comes with, you know, a divine um, imprimatur, then you have to look at the uh, at the Hebrew Republic. This is the one and only constitution he ever designed. Uh, and so that's why the people Paine is regurgitating turned to the Hebrew sources, as did their opponents, because that's where the action was. That's why um, uh, Paine's critics, the ones who really get into the argument, so, that, so there are a couple of critics. Um, Inglis is a kind of an, an interesting case. Chalmers is another, um, who really don't want to go there, basically. They just want to say, you know, this scripture stuff is just silly. This is for church. Uh, we can talk about this on Sunday, but this has nothing to do with politics. Uh, and they move right along and sort of mock the argument. Um, but the, you know, people like Cato and you know, uh, Smith in particular realize, you know, that's not going to cut it. I mean, this is having a huge uh, effect. And so it has to be answered uh, directly. Uh, and so he then you know, uh, sets out to do it, but because that's what he's answering, uh, the gospel virtually never comes into it because those, those simply aren't the passages uh, at issue in the debate. Yeah. 
Thanks very much. Uh, how very interesting and enjoyable. I wanted to ask two questions, if I could. First, um, about the extent to which um, your argument is really one uh, of historical contingency, focused very much on pain, or if you want to really emphasize um, other features of the context in which pain was um, acting, which contributed to the legs that allowed the argument to travel as far as, far as it did. And secondly, I wanted to ask whether what pain is appropriating from the rabbinical tradition is all substance, or if there's something also of the style of rabbinical um, commentary and debate which plays a role in, um, in common sense and in his, in his place in your whole story. Yeah, um, let me maybe take the second one first. There, there's, I see no evidence that Paine knew anything about rabbinic sources. Uh, you know, it, uh, so it's just that Milton did. So basically, he's just cribbing someone who cribbed. Uh, I mean, it would be wrong to say that Milton cribbed. He you know, used good scholarly practices of citation and told you where he was getting all of it. Uh, but uh, Milton was taking this out of rabbinic sources. Um, and the rabbinic sources were sort of organizing that 17th century debate. S William Smith knows this uh, and is kind of bringing these rabbinic arguments from the other side back in. So you know, there is, you know, not to get into it, but one of the things I, I talk about in the book is that you know, there, are, there are two traditions um, broadly. Uh, one a kind of majority and one a minority view uh, in rabbinic literature about the question of kingship. Uh, the majority one is the one in the Talmud, which, which says, no, actually, you know, there's a commandment to establish monarchy, and that's how to read Deuteronomy 17, and monarchists in Europe take, take that, and, and um, they do very interesting things with it. Uh, and then there's this other view, which is Midrashic, which is that you know, it's a sin. And Milton does reproduce the rabbinic language. So to that degree, yes, the style is preserved, um, you know, uh, the idolatrous pretensions of giving uh, flesh and blood, man, you know, all of that. So, you know, via Milton, via another translation of the rabbinic Hebrew, yes, uh, some of it is being preserved. But I mean, there's no evidence uh, that I know of that Paine himself actually um, uh, dealt with with, uh, with with those sources. Um, so, uh, so that, that's, that's what I'd say about that. About the context in general, um, as opposed to just pain, I mean, sort of what's going on. Uh, you know, th th there's a lot that I could say about that. Um, I think that the turn against monarchy um, that occurred, um, uh, so there's, you know, th there are two questions. And one was, was there going to be a turn? And the other is, what, what precise kind of turn? Uh, the first, you know, uh, with respect to the first, uh, I think it's um, precisely because um, uh, colonial writers, theorists, and so on had put so much stock uh, in uh, their conception of the king and his role uh, and had inflated it uh, in their minds uh, beyond uh, anything uh, uh, that uh, actually existed in reality. That is, you know, they, they're insisting all the way through, I mean, through to the Declaration of Independence, where the charge appears in the list of indictments, you know, in the, the list of charges against George III, that uh, the king should simply uh, veto uh, the offending parliamentary bill. He should have vetoed the Stamp Act. He should have refused to give his assent to the intolerable acts and so on. Um, and of course, uh, you know, in England, a British monarch hadn't vetoed a parliamentary bill for 80 years. Um, and actually, uh, they, uh, the, the, uh, the colonists themselves, thought it was even longer because they didn't know most of them. It's kind of interesting that they, uh, when they talk about this, uh, Anne had vetoed a bill uh, in 1707. That was the last one, the Scottish Militia Bill. Uh, but in fact, they don't know that. So they think the last uh, monarch to actually wield the negative voice was William III. So, uh, so they they have this very inflated sense of what a king you know can do, should do, and the fact that he's not doing it um, uh, then you know enrages them. Uh, and as they sort of rely on him and petition him frantically, sort of insisting that they uh, that they are prepared for him to uh, massively augment his prerogative powers uh, with respect to the empire, uh, just so long as he. Uh, sort of tames the English legislature as they see it, which is you know they, they want to deny that Parliament has any imperial role at all. Uh, when he refuses to take them up on their offer, and they get news in January '76 uh, of the King's speech declaring them uh, in rebellion, um, you know the the trauma is sort of palpable. I mean they're, they're sort of um, like spurned lovers. You know they're they're they're. they're um, 
uh, the, the uh, you know their 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 sort of view is just radically undermined very quickly, and it I think uh, there is no question that common sense arrives at exactly uh, the right moment to kind of tap into to that. Uh, to that sentiment, but as to what kind of anti-monarchism, that is just, you know, uh, the sort of ordinary Republican kind, you know, the Whig kind, um, uh, or the kind I'm talking about, I think that was really fatefully um, uh, influenced by pain uh, and by uh, this kind of rhetoric of biblical monarchy, idolatry, sin, and so on, and this shift uh, that I was trying to uh, talk about um, where the attention moves away from um, prerogative powers is the problem, uh, and dependence, and, and all of that, and toward uh, the status of kingship as idolatrous, improper, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and inappropriate to human beings. Now, that, that, I think, is, is, is really attributable to this moment. Yeah. We have time for one last question. Um, I had a question actually related to what you were just saying. Um, and I guess with my uncertainty about the scope of the claim that you want to be making here, do you mean to be saying that, first of all, for pain, this quote, Miltonic argument is the sole or main argument of his pamphlet? That's first. And secondly, you mean to be saying for the Americans as a whole that their anti-monarchism -monarch actually rests solely or mainly on this Miltonic argument? Yeah, well, that's very helpful. Um, the, uh, the, the answer to the first is um, no. Uh, you know, common sense, sort of good forensic style, is giving you tons of different arguments. Um, uh, the, the one about monarchy, I mean, the, uh, the, the one that, that uh, you know, the, the section that actually attacks monarchy head on is, uh, you know, predominantly given over to this. Uh, and that's the bit of it that sort of goes viral. Uh, in, in the way that it does, such that people then are either defending or feeling that they, uh, feeling that they have to answer it, and so on. So um, there are certainly other arguments. Uh, Paine gives arguments in common sense that are much more traditionally Whig. You know, that is, uh, you know, when, when he's talking about the negative voice, for example, uh, because he's he's doing lots of things at once. So on the one hand, he wants to say, eh, the, you know, King of Great Britain doesn't even do anything. What do you want him for? Uh, but then, you know. Uh, 20 pages later, he wants to say the fact that he has the negative voice means you're all slaves, uh, which makes it seem as if he does something. So, um, so you know, part of it is just which bits um, entered the bloodstream in this you know particular way. Uh, but Payne himself recognized that this is the one that uh, that people um, uh, sort of latched onto, and that he had put it in quite deliberately. In his case, probably quite opportunistically, which is to say, there's no particular evidence that he bought any of this. Um, whereas Milton certainly had, uh, so um, so the, so on that uh, the the second point um, is is also great and it's much more complicated. No, so this is not the only kind of anti-monarchism that there was, uh, and indeed when you. Uh, when you uh, when the rupture happens and you look at the first wave of state constitutions, for example, it was kind of uh, all of the people who had been getting into print uh, defending the prerogative and this new imperial uh, constitution with the king at its center and so on were all very upset uh, from seventy six roughly to nine. Um, with the exception of, you know, this kind of partial exception of New York in 77. But the early state constitutions had incredibly weak uh, executives and often in the, um, uh, in the various um, uh, sort of conventions or, or, or um, uh, legislative debates about the n new constitution, Whig arguments, kind of neo-Roman arguments about dependence and prerogative and all the rest were, were offered, assuredly, uh, and they never die. Uh, and, you know, uh, if you, when you go to the convention, um, you, uh, you see, you know, the great debate on the, that, that opens up the first day when they start uh, debating the executive is between James Wilson and Roger Sherman, where Sherman is just impeccably Whig, giving you absolutely the kind of um, dependence argument, um, the representation argument uh, against um, prerogative power in any single person. Um, and Wilson, uh, of course, gives you uh, the reverse, uh, but uh, what, uh, uh, and, and, and he's relating it explicitly to his understanding of the revolution, because he says, um, in response, um, you know, I just remind you uh, that you know, in our revolution, uh, we never rebelled against the king of Great Britain. You know, uh, we rebelled against Parliament, uh, and our quarrel was never with unitary 
power, as he puts it, but rather with the corrupt multitude. Um, so uh, those are still the two positions, but Wilson and the others recognize, uh, as it were, their way in, which is uh, to have prerogative, to have um, uh, to uh, that, because that these arguments uh, abroad in the country had so tightly associated republicanism as a form of government simply with the idea of not having the title and office of king uh, that um, uh, they could make the claim as Wilson did that you know uh, a chief magistrate is not a king uh, and simply because a chief magistrate is not a king uh, one could give him all of the prerogative powers that they were claiming uh, and trying to revive for the English crown in the 1770s uh, without uh, running afoul of republicanism uh, and that's, that's the shift that I think was made possible here uh, by this coming apart for the first time in the Republican tradition. I mean, you know, because, if, of course, in the, in the early modern Republican tradition, uh, you know, the great bete noir is, August, is Augustus, who exactly does, you know, who becomes princeps but not king, uh, and no Republican thought that, uh, that, um, uh, that there was such a thing as the Roman Republic after that moment, right? So uh, they would have, uh, you know, they didn't, uh, you know, attach this significance to title, status, rank, and so on. They were talking about prerogative and its extent, this makes possible a very, very different view about what's essentially Republican and, uh, and what uh, you know, the proper political principles exclude and then what they allow. Uh, so it's a way of bringing prerogative uh, uh, into uh, harmony uh, with some idea of what it means to be a republic uh, for the first time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again. Thank you. For, uh bringing these uh, texts and these events uh, to life for us. And um, I think that shows uh, symptomatically about, uh, how the book um, um, works and why it was um, uh, uh, heads above others in the competition. So, so it's my great pleasure to present to you the 2012 Laura Shannon Prize. Thank you very much. And uh, let me remind everyone that the book is available outside, and uh, you can look through it. You might even buy a copy, you know. God forbid. <laughs> so everyone have a pleasant evening and a great Thanksgiving holiday.